Okay, so in this part of the video, we will look at some C, uh, some research challenges in CQA processing, and some of these are um, are uh, mostly like uh, some of these are personal uh, opinions. Uh, so so take it with a with abundant caution, and uh, this is basically this we this part of the video is basically for the benefit of the younger audience, um, which includes research scholars who might be looking to work in this area, and um, and make a telling impact uh, in CQA analytics. <clears throat> So one of them, uh, one of the challenges is about leveraging external knowledge sources. So there is this field of uh, field of work called entity linking, which is uh, which is about connecting text with external knowledge bases such as Wikipedia. For example, you might have a text uh, a text segment like this. Um, uh, so until last week, it was impossible for Philip Hughes to, sm uh, to stop smiling and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, Philip Hughes is refers to a person and that particular person is probably a well-known person because uh, it refers to um, a particular cricketer. Uh, in this case, if you read through the next sentences, you will figure that out. Mm -hmm. And the task of entity linking is about taking this piece of text and identifying the named entities which have an external reference in a knowledge base um, from this piece of text. So, so, so it essentially requires you to uh, request identification of spans of text which refer to externally present entities as well as identifying the external external entity to which uh, that segment of text refers to. So here you have uh, now Philip Hughes referring to Philip Hughes Australian um, as the text segment that is that is that refers to Australia the country and uh, you have also Michael Clark and Michael Clark is a dis Michael, there are many Michael Clarks and it uh, it has disambiguated it to Michael Clark the cricketer. <coughs> okay. So, uh, and uh, entity linking enables uh, forming an entity footprint for questions and answers. So if you take the question part um, and do entity linking, you will be able to identify the entities that have been referenced in the question part. And if you do the same thing for answer part, you'll be able to identify the entities that have been referenced in the answer part. So we could, we could ask this question, can we determine question hardness by using such external sources? For example, is the dispersion of the questions entity footprint uh, indicative of the question's hardness? For, um, uh, so if, if the question refers to a variety of different kinds of entities, would it kind of tell you that it talks about uh, it talks about uh, various things and potentially it is a hard question? And can we determine the ex answer quality by using external sources? Or high divergence of the entity footprint between questions and answers indicative of poor answer quality? So if the if the question part of it uh, talks about three or four entities um, which are very different and which are placed in a very different part of the knowledge base as against those uh, entities that are referenced to the answer part, could we say that there is a bad quality alignment between that question and the answer? And you could look at enriching knowledge bases from QA data. So you have an unstructured data, right? And uh, and you can use the structured data in order to identify entities within it and be able to do something about it. And you could also add, um, add text to the structure. For example, you might identify that uh, that a particular connection uh, is repeatedly coming up in this in this one, and that might mean that uh, you might want to kind of change the knowledge base slightly in order to introduce a connection between the seemingly apparent two apparent pair of entities, uh, seemingly uh, apparently disconnected pair of entities. So you could look at adding adding structure to text. That's what we did as part of the entity linking, and and potentially there are other methods as well. And can you do the other way, like add text to structure? Okay. So, and another area of research could be effective QA. So in uh, effective computing is an emerging branch <coughs> in cognitive um, uh, systems these days and, and, and more so in machine learning, etc. <coughs> According to Wikipedia, the study and development of systems and devices that can recognize, interpret, process and stimulate human um, and simulate human emotions um, is, is what is referred to as effective computing. And this is becoming even more important as and when the human machine interfaces become more pervasive and uh, become more richer and, and more engaging. Okay, so can we derive emotional cues from questions and answers? For example, can we can we check whether the asker or the answerer is in a hurry? So so it, it kind of ends abruptly maybe, is it in a hurry? And that may not necessarily correspond to a relation, but it could be highly correlated with some, uh, uh, sorry, with an emotion, but it could be highly correlated with an emotion. And or uh, we can directly ask the emotion question, is the asker or the answerer angry? And if either of the above cases generally lead to low quality questions, we could ask the asker or answerer to rephrase. Mm, uh, so we could simply profile the questions and answers and look at that answer quality and the question quality from other kinds of sources and identify whether 
uh, the uh, whether angry questioners uh, lead to generally low quality questions or do they uh, or do they elicit lower quality answers and so on so you can do the analysis on the emotional facet and you could use a variety of resources so there is something called sentinet which is i think from the national university of singapore uh, which is which is an emotion uh, word emotionized word net and uh, there is something called senti word net and there is something called emolex as well and emolex um, as far as i remember correctly it is it is from the uh, national research council in canada in canada okay so can we um, uh, and another line of research could be about exploiting additional information in addition to qa most qa websites have a lot of additional information they have categories and that have been, that has been explored um, uh, so for example this paper in 2012 considers using categories for question or table and there has been exploration of the of the comments for example the semival 2016 2017 task on on a forum uh, on a forum data set which is from a web forum called qatar living it considers answer identification from comments and you could look at multimedia and pictures and video etc the people post along with answers and questions in order to derive some kind of extra, some kind of cues uh, in in order to improve retrieval or or any of the allied tasks in sql analytics and you could look at inappropriateness reporting information so you could look at downwards and upwards and and reporting reporting of um, i mean report of abuse etc in order to identify uh, well what kind of answers or what kind of questions are they correlated with and what can we do about them can we identify them automatically earlier on before people uh, do the reporting and um, another another area of research which could be of interest uh, could be the open ended qa Uh, um, so let's look at this particular example uh, from Cora. Uh, so, so the question says this: What is interesting? What is something interesting? Most people do not know, <clears throat> and the answer is the following, which says that um, well, basically it talks about this particular. Um, I mean, this particular picture talks about uh, people um, who are pirates and who wear an eye patch, and it and it get and it's. It starts um, arousing the curiosity in the reader as to what what the, what are these eye patches for and why are they only on one eye um, and why are they um, I mean essentially uh, typically worn only on one side of the on one side of the thing and so on and so forth. So and this goes on to explain as to why eye patches might not uh, might not be just a just a style a symbol which it could have morphed into a later on but initially eye patches were used to were used to um, kind of make sure that uh, there is an easy switch from the outdoor location to the indoor location and because pirates are, pro- are potentially in a high ten in a high tension uh, high high um, uh, well in an environment where they cannot afford to waste any time so so they need to get used to different kinds of uh, kinds of visibility uh, and quickly and so on so the the actual answer is not relevant but um, but what i wanted to highlight here is that uh, so, some most people what is something interesting most people do not know is this kind of quite an open ended question and it can be met with any kind of answer and this answer and the an- the interestingness of the answer and as you can see it has it has gathered up to 8400 upwards etc so the interestingness of the answer relies not in not much in relation to um in relation to the question with to which it was posted but in relation to the uh, curiosity ar- uh, arousing content in the in the answer itself so do existing techniques for qa matching work well for open ended qa and it is likely not because there is potentially no alignment between this question and answer it doesn't talk about any and doesn't even have any kind of common semantic concepts so how do we address this so that's that's kind of an interesting challenge especially in these days of quora where you see a lot more open ended questions and so on <clears throat> another area of another area could be about conversational qa so conversational interfaces um, were regarded as the ultimate test for artificial intelligence and this was uh, going back to turing's days in 1950 so users are well conditioned to keyboard querying right due to due to the popularity of web search and uh, that has been so for the last 20 odd years since the since the emergence of yahoo um, ask her google etc in the in the late 90s so can we build a conversational agent that works using qa historical archives um that can be used for, that can be used to engage the user engage with the user in a meaningful way um so let's look at an example conversation so the user says hard disk driver problem so this is more like a web search query where you're talking about a particular problem you're not you're not phrasing it in the form of a question <clears throat> and uh, what is the make of your hard disk is what the chatbot is asking because the chatbot has figured out that um at the make of the hard disk is important uh, to identify the driver and to identify a solution 
right and the user says ckt50 and uh, the chatbot then realizes that um, well within the driver problems for ckt50 maybe uh, there are there are some problems that relate to windows some problems that relate to linux and it asks for the operating system and the user says windows and it asks for which version of windows and so on and so forth and then the chatbot suggests a rephrasing saying that driver issue while installing ckt d50 hard disk on windows 7 machine is a good rephrasing do you agree to that and if you agree you can you can kind of accept to ask a question to the conversational interface mm, and the user could potentially agree in this case maybe maybe the user would agree uh, and and so on so and uh, uh, moving on to yet another area, um, uh, which is uh, which could be about serendipitous uh, QA exploration. So exploratory search is what we do uh, when when we typically engage in a Wikipedia session, right? In the typical Wikipedia session, you start with one page, drift onto a slightly related one, and so on and so forth. And eventually, after maybe 10, 10 or twenty um, or clicks, you might have reached an area you know, in the knowledge base which is which is kind of very different from what you started off with. So serendipitous search is um, a search uh, by a user with no a priori intentions who is interacting with the system to acquire interesting information, right? Can we suggest marginally relevant QAs uh, if we discover that the user is in an exploratory session? So it requires that the, it requires identifying that the user has not come in just to uh, just to uh, just to solve a problem. So yeah, just to identify the solution to a problem that he or she is having, which is typically the user who would go into Stack Overflow. Uh, but whereas the, the user might just be might just be looking for looking for interesting information, which is potentially the typical Quora kind of user. So marginal relevance on the question side or on the answer side or on both, right? You could you could ask these kinds of questions. So what what should it be marginally relevant to? Um, since you are reading the answer after the question, should it better be marginally relevant to the answer side so that there is a little bit of continuity for the user or should it be from the question side because the question side determines the topic of the answer as well. <clears throat> and uh, there is this emerging field of computational social science. There are even conferences dedicated to this, uh, this area these days. And um, uh, I mean, you could ask a lot of computational social science kind of questions on QA data. So what are the topics that result in highly disparate answers? Are those political questions? Are those religious questions? What are the topics that elicit deeply emotional answers? Um, are they, once again, political or religious questions? Or are questions with assumptions correlated with some topics more than others? So, uh, so do maybe geeks tend to assume that everybody is a geek and start with some jargon? Or, um, uh, or, or maybe uh, do, uh, do people engage in political science assume so? Or, or whatever, right? I mean, you can ask these kinds of interesting questions. And how can we identify accusatory questions and differentiate them from information seeking ones? Accusatory questions probably do not need an answer or probably do, do need some kind of filtering or a different kind of handling. Whereas information seeking one is a person who is genuinely seeking some information who might want to help him or her out, right? So in summary, you know, CQ is, is, is a distinct field and it, is, and it is different from information retrieval and factored question answering. It is different from information retrieval in the sense that it's a two-part text document and there is a, this lexical chasm problem which poses um, a lot of challenges uh, for the retrieval world. And it's different from factored question answering in the sense factored question answering answers tend to be just noun phrases or small, or small sets of, or, or, or a set of few words. Whereas um, uh, CQA answers typically tend to be much larger than much longer than the questions itself. So the lexical chasm between the Q and A parts retrieval of a CQA data sets has been a very active research area. Mm, uh, there's no, there's no questioning that it's uh, papers keep appearing every year. And other tasks such as expertise modeling, QA discovery, clustering have also been explored, but uh, only to a limited extent. And so there are a variety of challenges waiting to be explored and some of which are what we saw in the last uh, few slides. So I think I'll stop there and uh, I'll be happy uh, if, if you, uh, if you, um, I'll be happy to answer if you want to email me any questions at uh, deepaksp at acm.org. Thank you very much.